record it instead. So, uh, hello to all and thank you all for joining us on another episode of Wine and Viticulture Education. Um, my name is Gus Gluck, a London-based wine bar founder, professional taster, and now importer of wine. And, you and are I am Dr. Dylan Grigg. I am a freelance viticulturalist from Australia, and you may know me by my Insta handle, G Giller. Um, this is a continuation of our Viticulture and Wine series. Uh, normally it's live on YouTube, so you can ask questions and stuff, but today it's just on Instagram because there's something slightly wrong, but it's being recorded, so it will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you want to um, watch it back, um, you can. We've also re-uploaded um, our old uh, episodes we did. So we've just uploaded onto the SoundCloud, if you check my bio, um, Vintage 2020. Um, in an Australian context, which was a great episode. It was huge. It was like an hour and 15 minutes, um, but really, really <laughs> like, interesting to go for. Um, but we will upload more. And if you, um, like, if you want to uh, like, give us a bit of money to keep on doing the videos and stuff, uh, we've got Patreon as well. Um, so they far, will, they will have no... We'll have no excuses for our uh, production quality then, Gus. It's true. It will have to go up and it will go up. And that's why it's being like we're uploading all the, um, um, like all the audio to SoundCloud. Um, but anyway, we've got another really big subject this week, which is uh, cover crops and cover crops in vineyards or in viticulture specifically. Um, so Dylan, do you want to have a little start on that? Sure. Well, I had a little start while we're playing with the uh, having the technical issues. but That's true. Cover crops. Cover crops in viticulture, what is it? I guess the first thing to specify is right now, um, we're talking about cover crops in viticulture, so between the vine rows. I mean, we're growing perennial crops, so in between those, we need to manage that soil the best we can. Um, it's a whole nother ball game, um, cover crops in broad acre farming um, with no tilling and cash crops and catch crops and intercropping and it's it's another field. Some of that technology filters down to viticulture, which we can um, we can learn from. But mainly, we're just talking about um, talking about cover crops. So, what's a cover crop? Anything that grows between the vine rows, really. Um, there are four main types or classifications of cover crops. You can have um, annual seeded cover crops, where you cultivate and you seed species that you want that are only going to last for one year. They're usually referred to as a, a green manure crop, and they might be cut, cultivated, or even rolled into the ground. Um, there's perennial sward. We call a sward, which is just grass. Um, these can be seeded initially, so you get a suite of species that are suitable to your area and your growing conditions, and then hopefully they persist over time. Um, Permanent swards are usually in regions that have enough rainfall to maintain a nice green alley or mid-row for most of the year. Um, if you don't have enough rain to sustain a cover crop, then you go to annual regenerating swards, which is where you seed species that you want to grow in the vineyard, but they're of um, known attributes. So they don't have a lot of competition in summer and they'll actually hay off after seeding and go dormant, but they'll have hard seeds, maybe large seeds, but persistent seeds. And when rain returns in autumn, then they regrow, which is why they're called an annual regenerating sward. Those ones, um, they require careful management because if you're constantly driving over them and constantly mowing them, you can select, you might put in you know, six or eight or 10 species, but you might select for the ones that love to be mowed. And then after, 10 years, you end up just having uh, one or two species, which can be a bit bland. And you'll, uh, you might, depending on the questions we get, um, you might hear me talk about how diversity is a very good thing to have in your vineyard, trying to get away from a monoculture to more yeah. of a polyculture. Which brings me to the last, the, the fourth classification of cover crop, I guess is um, the specialist cover crop which might be a flowering annual. You've probably seen, um, oh, we're on Insta Live, so you've probably seen, you know, beautiful purple rose or red rose or yellow, just full of flowering plants, yeah. which um, form, form a, uh, an attractant to beneficial insects and form part of an integrated pest management program. So okay. if, you, if I break it down real quick and you think about it, 
in the vineyard, if you've got a if you've got it mown like your lawn, I mean it looks beautiful, it's green. But if there's any insects that are in that are in that grass and that starts to dry out over summer, where do they want to go for shelter or where do they want to go if you're constantly cutting it? Up. Oh. They want to go up into the canopy. So sometimes we don't want the insects to be up in the canopy. So keeping the grass a little bit, the grass or the species a little bit longer and having flowering plants and a thick sward in the mid rows can actually um, keep beneficial insects and um, keep predatory insects in the mid rows that can then travel up to the vines to keep things healthy and keep predators mm -hmm. or keep, keep non-beneficial or nasty bugs at bay. So okay. that's kind of a, a bit of an intro to cover crops. Did I cover why, um, why they're important? Uh, no, like not hugely. Not specifically. Okay. We had a bit of a yarn before this started. So um, why do we want to cover crop? Bare soil is bad, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the bottom line. If The main reason for having cover crops is to protect the soil. Now, you're protecting the soil not, not just um, by not cultivating it and not breaking it down with heavy machinery and heavy cultivation equipment, but you're protecting it from rainfall, erosion. So you've got a, if you've got a slope or any kind of um, angle and you've got completely clean cultivated and it rains like hell, which is what we're getting more of in this uh, changing climate, you get runoff and you get all of your beautiful topsoil that's taken a long time to form washing away. Um, windstorms, it's classic. Um, I saw it in Spain, but also in Australia. When you, get a, when you get a hot, dry wind in summer, the sky changes colour and it's all of our, all of our topsoil blowing away, all that um, fine nutrient-rich soil that we want to keep there. Mm. Um, so planting cover crops helps to hold the soil in place for preventing wind and rain erosion, but it also helps to hold the soil together and, and uh, kind of negate the negative effects of tractors and our management. So keeping macro and micro pores and roots going down into the soil so that when we do get rainfall, we get faster infiltration of water and we get deeper infiltration of water. So it's basically so, like nature's bubble wrap. Yeah, nature's, nature's bubble wrap and doona. And doona. <laughs> but, but slightly less sweaty. A bit less sweaty. And a bit less sweaty than, than bubble wrap. But if you, can imagine, if you can imagine the soil and you're cultivating, if you're always cultivating to the same level, you get what's called a hard pan yeah. because you're all constantly fluffing up the surface. And one way, to, uh, one way to link the topsoil through this hard pan is to have cover crops because A, you're not cultivating all the time, but B, you're getting roots to do the cultivating for you. So... If you think of a hard pan and we get a rainfall event, so this is your soil, you're cultivating mm -hmm. down to this point. It rains, boom. Once all those pores that are more than likely broken up with very little structure fill up with water, there's not much infiltration below this hard pan. So bang, you get a lot of water and then it runs off and you get erosion and you yeah. don't get the water to go deep into the soil. Whereas if you've got your hard pan or you don't have a hard pan because you're not cultivating but growing cover crops, broken and open from the roots you'll get higher infiltration and more infiltration into the soil and within that soil structure you'll hold more water so, so it i guess last two points it leads to cover crops having positive heaps of positive effects more positives than negatives but there are negatives you need to be careful when you manage a cover crop due to competition with the vines because as water being a limiting factor, um, you need to have species and management uh, that fit with your climatic zone so that you're not out competing your vines because you can see vine growth tail off pretty quick yeah. with a full like eyeball high sward of grass. Um, so yeah, like, could you give some examples of like, like the sort of cover like the sort of cover crops you'd use in like a much warmer, more arid climate compared to a cooler climate? Or, 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 or are they massively different? Uh, they're massively different and site, site dependent, depending on the climates, I mean, that you mentioned. So 
a warm, so a hot, dry area, which would probably, if they're growing grapes and it's hot and dry, it'll be winter dominant rainfall okay. or spring and autumn. You'll have a different suite of cover crops and they'll serve a different purpose than in a really wet area. So if you're in a wet environment, what do you want to, you still want to get access to the vineyard. So you might grow species that are deep rooted with large tap roots that actually apply some competition to the vines. Okay. So suck up some of that water. So in springtime, when you're trying to get on, get on the vineyard, um, you can pull some of that water out and evaporate it or transpire it away. Whereas if it's a very dry uh, and arid environment, you're not going to want a deep rooted species growing beyond spring and into summer. Mm. So you might have some overly competitive um, clovers or chicory or something like that might be great in a, um, in a cooler, wetter kind of environment. Yeah. Whereas if you have that where rainfall is limiting during the growing season, you're going to have some serious competition for your vines. So, so in the hotter climate, you'd have, you'd have just... In the hotter climate, in the hotter climate you'd be about building, building your soil structure so that your soil is the bucket that holds the water yeah. that feed those vines throughout the year. So you want to improve your, uh, your soil carbon and your soil health, basically. So you'd plant species that have known growth habits, which is the great thing about cover crops versus mm. weeds. Because weeds, um, they're pioneer species and they just, yeah. the they're just highly aggressive. Yeah. Whereas if it's dry, if you're in a dry environment, you can seed something autumn that you know as soon as it's gone to flower and you cut it, it's not going to grow again because it's an annual. Mm. Okay. So you can cut it in spring and it stays in the soil and it protects the soil, holds it together, allows infiltration if there is rainfall, but doesn't have a lot of competition against um, the vines. Actually, so an interesting, so like the actual edible like cover crops, um, can they be harvested or do they ever reach like maturity to be edible? Yeah, no, it depends. It depends on your environment. So one thing I love, I mean, I did it just last week, was just eating um, pea sprouts out of the vineyard. Yeah. You know, frosty morning, icy pea sprouts while we're oh, out taking, pr taking pruning weights. No, um, so it depends. If you have, if you are going to be facing a water deficit, so a lack of water, so you've had a dry winter and a dryish spring, you might terminate or cut your cover crop really early. Okay. Whereas if you've had a wet spring, and let's just say we're growing fava beans mixed with cereals and some peas and some vetch and oats and things, um, you might not get um, your fathers and your peas to maturity if you get a bit nervous about the water and you don't want the competition. But if you have a, a wettish spring and you want to suck up that water, you can leave those cover crops go a little bit longer. Mm. So then, especially high high nitrogen cover crops like legumes. Yeah. Um, after you cut them, you get a you get a quick spike in available nitrogen. So you might want to time that with vine growth. So uh, okay. just prior to flowering. Oh, uh, actually, yeah. So that, and that like and that can leads on to you what like, I always thought that cover cropping was really important was for was for nitrogen. Um, and is that one of the like you sort of being like a nitrogen stabilizer? So like, is it like like important in a vineyard that has a lack of nitrogen like during the growing season? Yeah, I mean, nitrogen's, well, it's a major limiting factor in viticulture or in cropping in general, which is why there's such a huge chemically based demand for it. Um, so one way to get nitrogen is like you say, with cover cropping with legumes. So you mentioned two things. One was growing your own nitrogen, which is using legumes to fix nitrogen and put yeah. it into the soil, which can be awesome. If you've got a thick stand of uh, vetch or fathers or something that is fixing your nitrogen, you can get a hundred kilos a hectare. You can, you can get a third more of your seasonal end demand from what you've grown in the off season. And the other thing that you mentioned was as a catch crop to stop the nitrogen leaching. So if you've been applying synthetic nitrogen or composts or things like that, and you do have a winter dominant rainfall, you don't want that end to wash through the soil 
and leach into the water table or leach away from the root zone of the vines. So what you can do is grow cereals, which consume that in and build it into the building blocks and carbon above ground and below ground with the roots so that you're catching it. Then you can cut it and it goes back into that cycle mm. in the soil. So also, and you should cover cropping as an idea, like has it gained more traction like over the past like five years or so? Um, because and it feels like it's due to, really due, to um, due to Instagram photos, you mean? Due to yeah, due to you you being a crop influencer, uh, <laughs> that you are you are a farming and crop. You okay. uh, no no, but like um, because it feels like it's and and I'm wrong, but and it feels like it's like how farming used to be, and then um, it's had some, some. It feels like it's had more of a renaissance and more of a like conversation amongst like winemakers or like all like yeah. all of its culture in general. I think. I think. I don't know whether it's a renaissance in terms of old school growers cover cropping yep. because it was always about um, it's always about reducing competition. So there's always been um, cultivation, and but the more that we learn about um, soil health, plant health, and how the soil is interconnected with the environment, is we're learning a lot more about cover cropping. And as people mm. move away from synthetic um, fertilizers and boosting your crops synthetically, then um, organics really needs to tie in carbon cropping. Okay. It's one way to get free in. It's one way to build carbon in your soil. You're building your sponge, you're building structure. There's only positives that come out of it, except, well, the negatives are cost and competition, but yeah. they are management issues. Wait, so what's cost then in general to do? to do cover cropping it it depends how fancy you want to be you know you can go out with um what's a classic a, a classic mediterranean or if we call it that um winter dominant cover crop mix might be pea no it might be oats and faba beans mm. and you might pay 90 cents or a dollar a kilo for those things or 60 seeds. cents sorry yeah, for seeds for seeds, yeah. or if you want to get super fancy and plant dichondra, you might pay like six hundred dollars a kilo. Wow! <laughs> or um, what did I price up the other day? Twenty bucks a kilo for a it was a flowering uh, flowering perennial. It just depends how common they are, but often you just use species that are commonly used in broadacre farming within your region, okay. and then you just spice up spice up the mix a little bit because. The more diversity you've got, if you had a really dry start to the stride start to the winter through autumn, and you've planted a, planted something that is needs a little bit more water, um, your cover crops can fail. So if you've got a few species in there, then you've got some insurance against dry conditions or frost or a late break to the season. Um, also, and Aaron's got um, a great question, which is, um, is cover cropping more expensive than synthetic fertilizer applications? I think in the, I think probably in the life cycle. Yeah, I, it may well be. Okay. Because you need to, you need to manage. I mean, nitrogen, well, it depends what you're applying. It depends what you're applying, really. I'd say it may be, but in the long term, in terms of sustainability, if you consider that as a cost, then you're going to come out on top cover cropping and managing mm. organically because you're not painting yourself into a corner applying um, synthetic fertilisers, which, which can degrade your soil structure and your soil health, and then you need to apply more and more and more. And it's a, a feedback loop that we're seeing time and time again, whereas cover cropping and composting can break that. Um, and then she also asked, um, is there a magic slash minimum number that should be in the diversity cover crop mix? I don't, I don't think there's any real rules. You just put in as many, as many as you can, as many as you can. It's a, it's like that old, um, the, well, the old saying, the saying people ask me, Oh, how much compost should I put out? And I'm like, how much can you afford? <laughs> yeah um, you can't 
you can overdo it with cover crops in terms of seed density and species mix because if you've got a lot of um, a lot of seeds per square meter, then there's interplant competition, so you're not going to get mm. a big thick stand. Yeah. So it also depends if you want uh, a competitive mix that's going to outcompete weeds. You want to go thick, but if you want to really get a lot of bulk, you need to go a little thinner in your seeding rate. So that there's less competition, but you're still out competing any of those um, pioneer species or weeds, and then you can get a decent stand. Like okay. I've had, I've had cereal rye like flapping over the bonnet of a tractor, like an eighty. No way. Tractor. Wait, was that a bad thing? No, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Yep. Yep, yep. So, what's the best cedar, George Williams? Uh, I'm a little little bit OCD, so I do love seeing the lines, you know, when you have a disc cedar. But I think um, if you're not putting, if you're not using a, um, a disc cedar, like a direct drill, and putting uh, fertilizer down right next to the seed, um, you can use anything from a cone spreader to a seed box on top of a power harrow. And they spread the seed evenly across the surface so you don't get those beautiful lines. Um, but yeah, you can use anything. I, I say to people, it doesn't matter. So long as you get those seeds out there and they can do their function, rude and crude. Um, also, and um, like, should you rotate your cover crops? That's what another person asked. Um, if, if you've chosen things that can attract disease or if you're in a climate that can attract um, disease, like certain legumes or if you've got a lot of um, like red-legged mites or things, if you're growing some clovers or medics, then maybe it's a good idea to rotate them out. But okay. cover cropping in Vidi isn't really like um, broad acre cropping where it's a real monoculture or can be a real monoculture and you need to flip your species because yeah. there you're often growing one thing because yeah. you need to harvest it clean for a market. Whereas in the vineyard, usually growing more than one thing. And if you're growing just a cereal, I think it's always good to um, rotate into that at least some legume. A 100% legume cover crop, oh, this will go on to what, what is the purpose or what's the goal with cover cropping in your situation if you're just trying to grow in so you want to grow nitrogen and you don't want um organic matter on the surface that's going to hang around for a long time grow a legume grow vetch grow um peas well peas like to climb up climb up the oats or go farther or something like that you get a lot of end but when you cut it you'll get a peak of end but then that residue the crop residue breaks down quite quick hmm. So if you don't like that and you want to have more cover on the ground, then you go for more of a cereal dominant, which has got a higher carbon to nitrogen and that stays on the surface for longer. So that's when you'd want to rotate. If you're going legume, 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 and you've got not enough organic matter on top, you want to see some cover and some protection, you might put a cereal in. If, or if you're going cereal, 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 high carbon to nitrogen ratio of the residues means that they're going to be taking nitrogen from the soil and from the vines in order to break down and form the humus in, form the humus in the soil. So you get a nitrogen drawdown effect. So that's why you might put a 60-40 or an 80-20, a little bit of legume in with your cereal, that supplies the N to offset what that cover crop is taking when it's breaking down over the summer and through the season. Um, also, and then John um, had a great question, which is, uh, look, in a highly fertile soil with quite high waterfall, would you cover crop every two rows or every row? Um, and why? In a high, so we're assuming that this is rainfall during the growing season. You're guessing so, and I'm guessing it like a cooler region, but with really, really fertile soil. Yeah, no, well then, I don't know why you crop every second. I crop every second often in drier environments oh, okay. or if you're transitioning to cover crops um, because you've got roots going everywhere and you don't want to apply too much, um, too much stress onto those vines. Plus, 
if you're going one row yes, one row no with your cover crop, you can choose which rows you put the tractor onto. So you can, uh, you can, you can avoid over trafficking and give certain rows a rest. So back to the question, I think you'd crop every row. And yeah. if you have, if you're mentioning there's like three queues that there's high rainfall, too much rainfall, it's probably a challenge to get a machine on during the growing season. Mm. You're probably dealing with a lot of canopy management. Yeah. So you want to hold your soil together and reduce your canopy management by applying competition. So you'd go deep rooted, something with big leaves that can grow some mulch. You can cut it and throw it, or you can just cut it and turn it in. But something that's going to suck up some so suck up some of that soil water, nice. but hold the soil together when you do have those big downpours. Um, also, Dave said uh, you're happy to leave seed on the surface if like if using a cone spreader. Are you happy to leave? Uh, yeah, if you're using a cone spreader, it's better to. Some people I've seen it work by leaving seed on the surface, but you're really feeding the birds and. Um, you're not going to get a, a high um, a high strike rate. You're much okay. better to run through with a disc or a um, stick rake, shallow tines, something first. And then you run through with your cone spreader and just a bit of um, reinforcing mesh or an old farm gate on the back just to cover, just to cover the, um, the seeds over because it's seed soil contact that means you get the best germination. Mm. Well, but um, Dave, you could also go with a cone spreader super early, like dry seed it. And if you're dry seeding it, you're waiting for rainfall. And when you get rainfall, you'll get splashed and you'll get some soil on top of the seed. So long as you don't have heaps of grass. If you've got heaps of grass, seeds will sit up top and they'll get, they'll get attacked, eaten, rot, or not do much. Okay. Um, also, and, and I feel like I'm going to be really, really simple here, but then... Could you like it? Yeah, in essence, like, uh, like, if, like, like, if it was a really like rainy April, or whatever, or like a rainy spring, could you actually September? September, like, could you actually harvest whatever your mid row cropping is, like the legumes, and offset the cost of that by selling them? Could you, if they yeah, were good? Totally. Enough? Yep. If you had a small, um, a small harvester that went between the vine rows, absolutely. Okay. And you can and you can actually buy them. Can you? You can yeah, you can uh you can harvest your winter prunings and roll them up into really tight bales. Yeah. To turn into pellets to burn in your fire or to well, make a make a hoobal bed out of, who knows. Um but you could you could do that. And you know, there's actually there was actually a study, I think someone did a cost benefit on growing melons and they actually grow melons down the rows they grow melons down the rows melons and okay where <laughs> where you where do they grow melons? In a, in a warm, warm irrigated warm irrigated area oh, okay usually uh, you get patty you usually get patty melons they're uh, they're occupying a niche that has water sunlight and they cover the grounds really well um so why not grow an edible melon instead of a stinky patty melon yeah, well, that seems like a really good idea, but obviously hey, it's far more work and just to harvest it, it would obviously like... Yeah, totally. One that, one that I'd love to do, which is, um, which is a bit fringe, but maybe I'll get there one day, is um, farm sunflowers. Okay, how come? That'd be pretty cool. Well, you know, we, we always spray copper in the vineyard for mm. mildew. And um, sunflowers are known to bioaccumulate copper. Really? So, yep. So but there's been no body of work done on this. Hey? Been, uh, and there's been no body of work done on this. There has been a bit of work done on it, but more to do with um, mine rehabilitation. The thing is, though, you grow it in the vineyard, the like, bioremediate or they bind up the copper but then we just cut things down in the vineyard spread it back under the vinyl back into the soil you'd need to like you say get a harvester cut them and take it away that's still pretty wild well if everyone's got like a vineyard who wants to do that they should or they should try it out dylan will come and have a look i'm sure 
Yeah, why not? Why not? Um, further away from Australia than I'm up now, actually. Um, also, you know, was, in, sorry, go on. I was just going to say in, in Tenerife, you know, um, those, uh, those crazy braided cordon vineyards? Yeah. yeah. You know, Jonathan was, um, <clears throat> he was telling me that they used to grow potatoes underneath them. Really? Which is a winter cover crop. Yeah. So the braided cordon would go out, they'd move it to the side, grow potatoes, and then when it was time to grow vines, Bring them back side that's by side. Cool. That's pretty wild. Well, and that's how you make money, like all year round. Yep. Um, exactly. Also- we're, we're, we're putting money back into the vineyard. We're making money in the mid row if we're catching our nitrogen, if it's been applied, or if yep. we're making our own nitrogen in soil. Um, also, like John was saying, um, is there any advantage to bringing sheep into a cover crop vineyard, which is obviously like a common um, or a more common thing? <laughs> Or like people yeah, a- absolutely. So long as you can sell graze and graze down hard enough so that I don't just go and pick all of the good stuff. But um, no, totally. Bringing stock into cover crop vineyards is an amazing tool for keeping um, certain weeds down, but keeping the grass down without a tractor. Oh. Not, and it's not just the, the vine row or the alley. It's across the whole floor. You just need low sheep or a high irrigation wire or no irrigation tube. Um, new, new issues, but. Um, also, uh, James also said that he has seen melons in mid rows before in Stellenbosch. So in South Africa, hey, there, are, nice. yep. there are melons, um, yep. which hopefully for the next episode, we'll be talking a lot more about South Africa. Oh, we will. We've got a special guest next episode. Um, <laughs> um, um, you also, James said, you, you, what are your views on brassicas for nematode control? From my point of view, awesome. Yep. Yeah. Um, many people don't know there's certain types of brassicas that are more effective at controlling nematodes because as the as the brassica grows, it releases a nematicide, so a chemical which which kills off nematodes. Wow. So there's a there's a little vineyard I'm working with, a little Sinso vineyard that is being seeded with a brassica this week, hopefully because it's on sand and nematodes love sand and we'll be planting straight into it and not wanting to um, neutralize the soil with chemicals, we're using brassicas. And I think for the first few growing seasons, we'll grow a thick stand of um, there's a winter mustard or something like that and we'll turn it in and then grow it again and turn it in to try and keep the nematode numbers at bay while the vines are young until they can outcompete them and get mm. their roots down. So no, that's an awesome one. And if we're talking about um, nematicides or using a plant to deter nematodes or kill nematodes is a form of biocontrol. Um, buckwheat has another, has another interesting property which you can use as a cover crop, which is allelopathy. Do you know what that is, Gus? No. So allelopathy, allelopathy is super cool. Allelopathy, plants um, exude chemicals that deter other plants from either growing either roots or from seeds germinating so buckwheat you know it's a little it's only a little plant it doesn't cover a lot of the ground surface but it's got very strong allelopathic qualities so as soon as its roots start to grow it's releasing chemicals and knocking out any other seeds that want to grow then when you cut it it does the same thing Wow, so it's think, like a, yeah, it's, well, so it's like nature's it's pretty, condom. It's just stopping, <laughs> it's just stopping yeah. germination. Yep, pretty much. Well, I mean, that's that's a cool one, but a, a common one that you'd see is like a, a pine tree. That's a pretty gross type of allelopathy by physically uh-huh. poisoning soil underneath. But we can choose cover crop plants for their allelopathic um, properties. Mm. which there's other cereals and other um, species that are good for it, or we can try and not use them because of that and it can actually affect vine growth. Wow. Well, well, this, well then this could probably be a good place to kind of end. I mean, um, because we've done about 35 minutes of this, um, but we'll cover crop, I mean, like just to sum it up, like fantastic. You people should keep on cover cropping. Is that the sure- take home? We should keep on cover cropping. Am I still on Insta? Because you've gone there a bit. We go. 
you're back. But yeah, people should. I'm come. back. No, I keep. Oh, with parting parting comments. Yeah, we should consider cover cropping, even if it's a really dry environment. There's always some species that you can choose from a plant palette perspective. Um, and if you really want to look after the soil and minimise your synthetic inputs, especially if you're composting, one way is to capture the energy, the energy of the sun and lock it in your soil by using plants. The soil wants to be covered, yeah. so let's cover it for as long as we can. Cover it and love it. So oh, that's you, it. You, you, that's the take home. Um, but um, like, thank you for everyone who's taken part and. Um, put in so many great questions again, like it's just, again, it's fantastic and, um, and it shows that people gen like genuinely want this discussion and hopefully benefit from this. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's good fun, guys. I, I, you know, we like yarning about this stuff. It's true, <laughs> it's true. Before and after, but we can do it and share some knowledge and get it's some true. good feedback, then um, happy uh, days. But yeah, no, um, uh, so, this, so, so this isn't live on YouTube, it'll be live like by the end of today. Um, We'll be back in two weeks for a with hopefully a special guest, um, which will be far more interesting than me talking to Dylan because it'll be someone who knows a lot more than I do talking to Dylan. Um, and yeah, just other than that, just please send us any questions or if you want us to do any of these, we're more than happy to to take suggestions and do subjects that like everyone else would like. Um, but again, like thank you and again, and I was Gus Black, and I'm still Dylan Greig. And we'll catch you on the next one. See you around. Thanks for joining.